Welcome everyone to my channel. My name is Dorota Puja and this is My Planet TV and my guest for today is Dr. Derek Farrell, uh, President of EMDR uh, UK and Ireland and Co-Vice President of EMDR uh, Europe. Uh, welcome and thank you for accepting the invitation for the talk. Not at all. It's, it is literally my pleasure to be here, so thank you. Okay, so we'll be talking about trauma today um, and about this method which is called EMDR therapy. As I know, you have been um, working with this method for over 20 years, is that correct? Uh, that's very true, that makes me sound very old, <laughs> but this is also true. <laughs> and I also know that you go into um, places where people need help in terms of trauma intervention and you work with people in crisis. Uh, so we'll go into that as well. But first, I would like to focus on um, this EMDR therapy. And uh, I'd like to start from asking a question of how would you define trauma? Because many people, mm, they associate trauma with PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. And that is one thing that is also needs attention, uh, therapeut therapeutic attention. But... Um, what would you define could be the symptoms of trauma uh, in general? Well, it, it, it's actually a very good question, but there are lots of different layers to the question. I think defining trauma is the first place to start because a trauma is any experience that involves stress, fear, or a challenge to a person's integrity in, in, you know, in some particular way. Because when a person encounters a, a stressful event, the, the body, if it feels threatened, then has this huge amount of stress hormones surging around the brain and the body. And often, the brain and the body has the potential for dealing with that situation. Uh, but in certain circumstances, the body gets overwhelmed. It is not able to integrate that experience. So after a particular trauma, a person is, is constantly trying to make sense of the experience. Sometimes people can do this, and sometimes that information processing system gets impaired. And in those situations, the person is much, much more likely to become traumatized as a consequence of that experience. Yes, and when we first met, we talked about, and you gave uh, an interesting statistics, and uh, I would like to um, focus on, on, on this example for a bit. You told me that, for example, when there is a train delay derailment situation, out of 100 people, seven, statistically, would be traumatized. So what would you think be could be the reasons behind uh, the fact that those seven people would be traumatized, traumatized and the rest not? Well, it will be 7% of those 100 will develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. So there's two ways of looking at that. One is how do we make sense of the 7%? Mm -hmm. And the other is how do we make sense of the 93%? Okay. So yeah. the 7% are people who found that experience distressing and a threat to themselves. So they thought that their life was in danger. They thought that their life was going to end or that they were going to be injured in some particular way. So this is what it's meant by an experience that actually challenges their sense of self, their sense of integrity. The 93% uh, there will be a proportion of those that will be distressed by the experience, that will be upset by the experience, but they have mechanisms in place in order to help process and assimilate that experience. So things that they could do to help is they will talk to people, they will write about it, they will email, it's they will blog, they will write on Facebook, you never guess what happened to me today, uh, they will go to bed, they will dream about it. And these are all natural ways that people are then able to process and digest a troublesome, difficult experience. So that's how we make sense 
of people who have been involved in a railway accident. The problem is if we change that scenario to, instead of it being a railway accident, and we change this to gender-based violence or sexual assault, mm -hmm. what we see is a completely different pattern. Because people who have experienced sexual assault are much, much more likely to be traumatized by that experience. Because that, oh, yeah. be, be, because that trauma is much more invasive, it, it's, it's much more damaging, uh, it's, uh, it's more of a challenge to the person's integrity. And that's why with that client group, they are more likely to develop PTSD. This is very interesting. Okay, so um, now I would like to talk about, um, because we'll go into much more details of how EMDR works in a moment, but let's just, um, let's just focus for a bit on how um, can this dramatic, trauma traumatic e events in our life, how can they be expressed in our daily life, for example? So f in other words, who can use EMDR therapy and for what uh, symptoms? Okay. Well, if we, look at, if we look at it in steps, why do you get 7% from a train and you get 93% from a rape? If you're involved in a railway accident, yes, it's devastating, yes, it's profoundly traumatic, but it's also impacted lots of other people who were on the train. That's very different from rape, because rape is much, much more personal. It's, it's, it, it's more intrusive, it's more invasive in that sense. So how those symptoms show themselves is usually in, in a number of different ways. The first is what we call re-experiencing. And, and this is where people often get unwanted memories of the experience. They get flashbacks, they have bad dreams, maybe even nightmares. The second is that they experience what we call hyper arousal, which is where people feel acute anxiety and very, very high levels of distress. And, do, and don't know why they are anxiety. Yes, have mm -hmm. it, it's because the part of the brain that's, that's responsible for um, recognizing fear is overactive. It, it's very, very hypersensitive. Th the third bit is that because these memories and these traumas are so distressing, is there is a very strong urge to avoid and, and so we get involved in, in lots of what we call safety behavior. Okay. So we don't want to do things because oh. they will remind us oh, yeah. of the traumatic experience that we've had. The fourth one is the fact that when we have an experience, our brain tries to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. And so we develop a, an internal meaning and an external meaning. So an internal meaning is we can often see some corruption in the way in which those cognitive files present. So a person can have a traumatic experience and the way in which the cognitive processing works is they feel as if in some way it was my fault, in some way I deserved it, or in, in, in some way I, I, I'm powerless to control these situations. It may even change people's worldview which is where they start to see places as very dangerous. They may see men as very dangerous. They may see countries as very dangerous. So they're the four main cluster of symptoms is re-experiencing, hyperarousal, uh, in terms of avoidance behavior, but it also changes your belief systems about yourself and about the world. Uh, what I feel also that people need to know about um EMDR therapy and working with trauma is that f it's not about facts, it's about emotions. So for me, for, for what could be dramatic for me in terms of experience, for example, uh, let's, let's say a divorce, for example, for me, it would be traumatic and I could be traumatized by this experience. And for example, for you, it wouldn't. That's just, 
Well, you, you, you're, you're correct in terms of the fact that um, the way people encounter experiences is very subjective. So a, a, a person can be exposed to an event and may find that devastating and traumatic. Another person may be exposed to exactly the same event but may see it as an opportunity for growth, may see it as an opportunity for development, you know, in, in that way. Y your question focused on emotions, and emotions are important. Th they play a very integral part in, in, in trauma. But emotions are only part of the story. In trauma, we need to look at it in terms of memory. Is Why is it that a trauma memory is stored in the brain differently from a story memory. Mm -hmm. So you may have a person who may describe a traumatic event mm -hmm. that happened 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, and that memory is clear, it's concise, it's distressing, it's uncomfortable, but it's not processed, it's not changed. This same person may not be able to tell you what they had for dinner a week ago and that's because one is a trauma memory and one is a narrative memory now if we look at what are the characteristics of these trauma memories we know that they often have images and visual recollections of the experience which may be the point when the person's partner says i don't love you anymore i, d I don't want to be with you uh, they may be acoustic where the person hears those words over over and over again they may be um, uh, around cognitions and beliefs where you think well i'm unlovable nobody cares for me i'm not a good person uh, they will be emotional because they will cause cause distress or cause anxiety but they'll also be physical is the fact that you don't okay. just don't just have an emotion on its own the link between emotion and a body sensation is very, very strong. And so, uh, you know, so an upset will often be felt in the body, often in forms of tension or often in the form of pain in some way. So when we're, when we're dealing with trauma, we need to deal with all of these systems, all of, all of these levels. Uh, let's go now into more details of, on how um, how the method work. Um, the uh, the, um, the person who came up with the idea of EMDR is Francine Shapiro, and I read that she um, she was having difficult times. Uh, the, uh, she was having a period of difficult time that she was battling cancer, and she was going for a walk. And when she was walking, she noticed that uh, when she was having disturbing thoughts, her eyes were making a certain movement. And once this movement uh, happened and stopped, those disturbing thoughts disappeared. And this is uh, how she made this chance discovery of EMDR uh, therapy. So could you go into more details on how it works and what can a person who goes into a session, what can a person expect from it? Again, it's a very good question, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated yeah. question, so let's go through it. Um, you're right, EMDR therapy was developed by uh, an American psychologist called Francine Sh Shapiro. Um, she was uh, in a period of life where she was going through emotional turmoil, mm -hmm. and she was out walking one day. She was obviously very consumed by um, uh, situation and her, uh, her, her level of disturbance and because she with this was distressed her body was agitated mm -hmm. you know um, understandably this is profoundly uncomfortable and um, a typical anxiety stress trauma response is is that the, f the fact that the um, is that our eyes can very quickly move from, from side to side. Now we call this a, a, what's called a saccadic movement, which is a sudden jerkiness, you know, uh, mo movement in that sense. So the critical bit in her discovery was noticing two things. One, 
is that she was aware of the distress and turmoil that she was experiencing at that particular moment in time. And the second is that she was aware of her eyes moving very quickly from side to side. Mm -hmm. So it was something about the fact that it's those two positions. So she was aware of her level of distress and what was going on for her, but was aware of her body responding in a certain way. And what she effectively did is was, was mindful of both of those situations. So giving attention to one and then the other, then back to the other, then back to the, back to the, back to the other. And as she became aware of that switching, that process, she noticed that when she went back to what it was that she was disturbed about, she found that actually that level of disturbance had subsided. So there was something about that dual attention of almost like stepping into the memory and stepping back into the here and now. Stepping into the memory, stepping into the here and now. And when you're in the memory, being observant of the fact that your, your, your eyes are moving in a bilateral movement. Like during a sleep, right? Well, that's one of the hypotheses surround, surrounding why we think EMDR works, is the fact that one of the s critical stages of sleep is rapid eye movement. Mm -hmm. And rapid eye movement plays a part in information processing, um, where the, the brain is digesting and trying to make sense of the experiences that it's actually encountered over the course of the last uh, of the last period of being awake. Now, in EMDR, on one level, one argument is that you're mimicking that same process. It's like you're trying to jumpstart the brain's natural information processing mechanism. Now, another hypothesis is the fact that actually um, we have what's called working memory. And working memory is a very short-term memory that we use for remembering um, important bits of data, but in the short term. So if I, mm -hmm. if I told you a, um, a series of numbers that represent a telephone uh, number, um, it's what your brain does in order to try to remember the numbers. So what the bilateral stimulation does in working memory, it actually puts a loading on working memory. And what that then does, it means it sort of helps to shift your attention um, a, a, away from the traumatic experience to then allow the brain to then move on and to then sort of digest it. So you're not mind wiping the memory away because the memory is real. The memory is part of your story. It, it's an integral part of your narrative. But what you are doing in EMDR therapy is you're shifting the, the way in which the brain digests that information. And you're effectively moving that from what we call a trauma memory to a narrative memory. Mm -hmm. Okay, so could you give an example of actually how it works for uh, someone who has experienced any kind of trauma and what symptoms uh, that mm, this person had, for example, and what happens when those symptoms symptoms subside? How does it affect in f in, in you know in practice a person's life? So say you take a client who's been involved in a road traffic accident mm -hmm. six months previously, and the way in which they present for treatment is that they are having uh, flashbacks, mm -hmm. unwanted memories of the of of the experience, and these flashbacks are very difficult. They're very painful. They're very vivid. They're also experiencing hyperarousal. So every time they get into a car, mm -hmm. they think that the event is going to happen, uh, happen again. Mm -hmm. The third thing that happens is the fact that they do not drive past the place where the accident happened. They, they avoid it. And the reason why they avoid it is because they don't want to be reminded of the incident and where the incident took place. The fourth bit is the fact that, that even though their logical brain, their rational brain, knows that the accident was, was not their fault, mm 
their emotional, just you know, limbic brain is questioning that judgment. So, so the thoughts that are constantly going around in the person's head is maybe I should have done something, maybe I should have seen the car coming, maybe if I'd have been more vigilant, maybe if I hadn't been thinking about something else. So the person makes sense of the experience often in a very self-critical, in a critical way. So in EMDR therapy, we recognize that these are the core parts of their trauma. So they have re-experiencing, they have hyperarousal, they have avoidance behavior, and they have negative assimilation of the experience. In EMDR therapy, w what we do is we want to activate the core parts of that memory. What's the worst image? What's the negative thoughts that you have in relation to that experience? Uh, what emotions does it generate for you right now as you think about the memory? Where does your body feel that disturbance in, you know, right at this particular moment in time? And as that memory is, is activated, we then stimulate this through bilateral movement. So it's like the person is stepping into the memory, and when they're in the memory, they're subjected to bilateral stimulation. And then when they're out of the memory, we're then asking them to reflect and then think about what did you notice, what, you know, what, what was different about the, the way in which you were seeing that particular memory. And what we uh, effectively are doing is we continue that process until the level of disturbance that that memory creates subsides. Yes, and uh, what I think people might be kind of afraid, um, what might people, um, what might hold people um, um, before going into th therapy is what you said, that you kind of go into the eye of the storm, so you have to go there. People might be afraid of going back there to this memory, but I myself experienced uh, EMDR therapy, and I, I must say I, it's important for me to share it with people that really uh, when you think about this memory before the therapy, you might be get emotional, you might cry, you might, you might really relive it again and again. And after, uh, for me, it was two sessions. I just could talk about this experience in a, in a normal way. So this is what actually EMDR does. Yeah, Th this is exactly it. Yeah, that's a very good example because what you're, what you're talking about uh, initially is when the memory was distressing, this is a good example of trauma memory. So you, part of your brain is still remembering the experience as if it's happening now, as if it's very, very fresh. What EMDR does, it helps you to the brain to then process that, that information to the point where you will always know you had that experience. You will always know that, but you're shifting it from trauma memory to a narrative memory exactly. where you're then able to tell the story without getting all of that hurt, that pain and the upset that exactly. goes with it. So maybe something um, that could be kind of encouragement for people who don't want to go back there to this memory, to this trauma. Yeah. I, it's like if you don't go there, you will relive it again and again and again because it might be a color that you see that you that you subconsciously associate with the color of, for example, the blood that was during the accident. And wha once you see a red color everywhere, you're subconsciously kind of going into anxiety or, or having distressing symptoms. But once you go to EMDR therapy, this me memory can be, as you call it, a narrative memory instead of distressing memory, traumatic and memory. That's, and that's very well put. I mean, you're absolutely correct in, in, in the way in which you're viewing it. because. The diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder is only made one month after the traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. Now this is very important. This is very important. Because what that recognizes is that after a traumatic experience, the body will go into a typical acute stress response. Uh, but, but it often takes a certain amount of time 
for the body to be able to digest and process that experience. Mm -hmm. And on average, the research literature supports that that takes approximately three to four weeks. Now, one of the clinical features of PTSD is avoidance behavior. Now, avoidance behavior makes perfect sense. You avoid something because you don't want to be reminded of the traumatic experience. The thing about avoidance behavior is that initially it's helpful because it stops you being distressed. It stops you being agitated. The problem is, is that if you keep doing it, that helpful way of dealing with it starts to become unhelpful and starts to effectively create more difficulties for you. So, so you're right. What the research supports is the, the psychological treatment interventions that are effective for dealing with trauma are what we call experiential therapies. So these are therapies where you work directly with the memory. You have to go there. You, 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 have to, you, you do have to go there. You can't just talk about it. No. Because talking about it doesn't, doesn't change the help. memory. No. You have to experience the memory. Yeah. And part of that re-experiencing is to be absolutely connected with it. And one of the two most effective treatment interventions for dealing with memories in an experiential way is EMDR therapy. Yeah. And that's why this is a very, very important evidence-based treatment for dealing with trauma. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know that you go into those places of crisis around the world um, with trauma at Europe. Uh, why is it important to um, get help immediately after a traumatic event? We have to look at this in a number of different ways. If, if you take um, my own country, United Kingdom, we have a very well-established uh, health service which has a very skilled mental health provision. It has well-trained psychiatrists, psychologists, psychotherapists, all trained in trauma treatment. Mm -hmm. And what we've recognized is the fact that actually the quicker you're able to get access to effective trauma treatment, the more likely you are to reduce long-term disturbance. The problem is that model is not available throughout the world. So if you take a country like Iraq, mm -hmm. which has been involved in decades of conflict, you have very high numbers of traumatized populations. The problem is, is the fact that you don't have the mental health resources or the mental health strategy in order to address the psychological burden that that community is, is going through. So the projects that we are involved in are countries where the mental health provision is not strong and the level of awareness and understanding of psychological uh, trauma is also fairly weak. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we go in, we we try to introduce a concept known as trauma-informed care, which is raising the uh, awareness and the profile and importance of psychological trauma. The second is then to identify a workforce that you can then empower and train, support and supervise to be able to then deliver psychological treatment methods that we know are supported by research. Dr. Farah, what happens if people don't deal with trauma, don't process those painful memories? Well, when people don't process those difficult memories, we know it leaves scars. Mm -hmm. And those scars can often show themselves in a number of different ways. It can create psychological disturbance. Mm -hmm. It may even create mental health disturbance. Mm -hmm. But it can also create physical health problems. Mm 
And this is uh, an area of trauma which is often under-recognized and under-acknowledged. Under but there's also a fourth aspect, mm -hmm. and that is we have to look at trauma from an, what we call an intergenerational perspective. Is that if you have a traumatized adult okay. that is not effectively treated with trauma, what happens when that adult has children? the possibility is that that trauma is then passed on to the child. And the child is then exposed to uh, all the same stresses and pressures uh, that, the, that the adult faced. And so we start to see this in what we call intergenerational trauma. So a boy who sees his father constantly physically assaulting his mother mm -hmm. one of the messages the child may grow up to believe is the fact that when you get angry you externalize that anger mm -hmm. and one of the ways in which you externalize it is towards women mm -hmm. and so what you do is you end up repeating that same cycle of trauma that same cycle of revenge and retribution that we often see in places that have been exposed to, to long-standing uh, no trauma experiences. Yeah, I isn't it uh, the case that people say uh, like father like son, but the son was raised by his father, right? <laughs> so he learned. This is true. Uh, I, I, I mean, this is why in many ways it's not an exact science because you do see those patterns. Yeah. You do see those patterns. Yeah. But you also see the opposite. You also see the opposite. And this is why I think there's a lot of great hope and, 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 and possibility in us as human beings, is that we have the potential to grow. Mm -hmm. We have the potential to change. We have the potential to forge out new connections. And, and this is why I think you know, things like EMDR therapy can have a very, very significant part to play. Because if you have a traumatized population that is not being able to access effective psychological support and psychological intervention and treatment, then you run the risk of traumatizing future generations further down the line. I'm not saying that EMDR therapy is the solution, but what I am saying is that it, it can be a powerful way of trying to address what we would call the global burden of psychological trauma. Yes, and uh, uh, we are in Rzeszów at this point, and you are uh, carrying out a workshop here on EMDR therapy. You're teaching um, a psychologists, therapists, doctors who came here to learn. And as you said about this um, generational burden of trauma, I feel that Poland really needs that help. Uh, really needs that people who uh, who know how to deal with trauma properly and EMDR seems to be the best option as um, as it's very effective so um, I would uh, love to encourage um, people um, to check out the website I will give the links uh, people from Poland who would like to seek help in EMDR therapy um, and thank you, Dr. Farrell, for uh, firstly coming to Poland and teaching, and uh, secondly for um, devoting your time to have this interview and to talk. Thank you for 